Hello everyone. I, my name is Kelton Kato and I'm actually a director um, on the KIA board. And if you can bear with me, because um, I was just told this morning that I would be speaking. Actually, our president, Michael Libertini, is not able to be here this morning. Uh, so normally, he would be doing this. But anyway, I just want to thank all of you for coming, uh, for coming to our general membership meeting and uh, for taking time out of your busy day uh, to be here and, and join in the conversation as well as listen to our, uh, we're lucky to have some good guest speakers today. I'd like to, uh, a big mahalo goes out to David Busters, who is a KIA member, for helping us uh, with this great venue, as well as the lunch, providing the lunch at a special price for KIA. So now I'd like to introduce the KIA Board of Directors. Um, we have several of them here. So our KIA Treasurer is Baron Nakamura, and the Directors are Gary Evora, and Andrea Galvin, and she's here. Andrea, stand. Mark Higa, myself, Paul Kimura, Kurt Moranta, Sanford Mono, I think Sanford is here. Dexter Okada, Peterson Rosario, Peterson is in the back uh, there. Jeffrey Sanborn, and Steve Sullivan. So I'd like to thank the board for all the work they continue to do for KIA, and last but definitely not least, our executive director who pretty much coordinates everything for KIA is Sherry Goya. So we also have a table in the back where KIA members have placed flyers, uh, brochures, magazines, business cards that uh, can be picked up after the meeting, so please check it out before you leave. Um, and we, this is just a couple of announcements. We have a KIA fundraiser form out in the front on the table. Uh, we have, actually have the KIA fundraiser coming up, um, what is it, at the end of, oh, right here it is, okay. So here's the form, and it is gonna be at Real Gastro, Gastro Pub on Tuesday, September 24th from 5.30 to 7.30, and it's $100 per person. So this is a fundraiser for KIA. So please, um, if you have it, then uh, go ahead and grab that form and, and sign up. We also have another networking event, which is scheduled for Wednesday, October 30th. So anyone in, interested, um, in contact you, Sherry. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, and her name is Coralie Chan Matayoshi, and she is the CEO of the American Red Cross Pacific Islands region, which uh, includes Hawaii, Guam, and Saipan, and she previously served as a part-time district court judge for the state of Hawaii. Uh, she's also been an executive director of the Hawaii State Bar Association and trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division in Washington, D.C. Coralie is a graduate of Punahou School and the University of California, Berkeley, Hastings uh, School of Law. She, she served on the University of Hawaii Board of Regents for five years and is currently on the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau Board and Diamond Head Theater Community Advisory Board. She is a former Narcissus Queen and mother of three. Coralie was named by Pacific Business News as the 2010 Businesswoman of the Year for Nonprofits. So let's give a big round of applause to her. Thank you. I was going to bring a huge um, screenshot of. Hurricane Lane is a Category 5. I should have. I thought it was going to be too dark, so I didn't want to do a PowerPoint. But anyway, you know, one less than a year ago, um, Typhoon U2 struck um, Saipan with winds of 180 miles an hour, with su uh, sustained wind, with gusts up to 235 miles an hour. It was the most powerful storm to hit the United States in 81 years, worse than Harvey, worse than Katrina. And it turned from a Category 1 to a 5 in just one day. The eye passed directly over the islands, decimating concrete structures, concrete um, utility poles, and injuring 100 people with flying glass and debris. Then the tiny island of Tinian, 
which has about 3,000 people, looked like a war zone. Every roof of every house was ripped off. And for days, the residents had nothing to eat but humanitarian rations, which I hear is worse than MREs, the meals ready to eat. We were finally able to, by military transport, get 2,000 hamburgers from McDonald's from Guam. And that was their first hot meal. So Guam and Saipan are part of our region, and I have three employees from Saipan, and they had substantial damage to their homes. John's sliding glass door in his living room blew open, and all of the glass and the, the water was all over the place. Mary Ann and her husband huddled in their bathroom and said that it sounded like a freight train. They, they were terrified for three hours. They thought they were gonna die. And they have a concrete home, and they put plywood on their windows, but yet the roof of the neighbor's, um, the, the neighbor's roof flew into their kitchen and caused substantial damage. So it seems like nothing works against a five. And then, um, so now 10 months later, they're still living in um, FEMA tents. I went there not too long ago, and the school is being held in um, portable classrooms. So can this happen here? Yes, it's not if but when. So Iniki happened 27 years ago. It struck Kauai with 145 miles an hour winds. It was a category four and it killed six people and caused $1.6 billion of damage. Last year, everybody remembers Hurricane Lane. It threatened the whole island chain as a category five with winds up to 160 miles an hour. And the entire um, island of Oahu was within the cone of uncertainty. So we were really scared, all of us, right? It was the wettest hurricane in US history after Hurricane Harvey. 1,800 people huddled in 36 evacuation shelters. And then there were three wildfires that happened in Maui at the same time. In the middle of the night, we had to move like 200 people from the hurricane evacuation shelter to another shelter to escape the wildfires. And then we responded to five um, everyday home fires that same week. So we were kind of busy. Um, so the NOAA forecast, last year it was three to six um, hurricanes or, or storms and all six of them reached hurricane strength. In the beginning of the hurricane season, they said five to eight and there was an El Nino. El Nino is a little bit down, but still it's supposed to be above average. So we shouldn't let our guard down. A UH study on climate change um, predicts sea level rise, of course, with more flooding King tides, beach erosion, warmer waters, less wind shear to break up the storm. And instead of passing to the south like it usually does, it's going to come closer and reach landfall more often. Hawaii is the most isolated population on the face of the earth. Do you know that we're right in the middle of the Pacific and people don't realize? You know, people think of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. They have Florida next to them. Saipan has Japan. We have nobody. So we need 14 days of supply because we can't just drive from the mainland to help anybody and, and it's hard to just leave, right? We also have just-in-time delivery of um, goods because we don't have warehouse space, right? And we import 90% of our goods and 100% of our fuel and almost all of them arrive by sea. If the port is, um, the Honolulu is a single port of entry and so if it's damaged, too bad for the neighbor islands, right? Um, 3,000 tons of food arrived daily from the Honolulu port. And um, uh, if it was damaged, it could result in shipping import ceasing for 19 to 30 days. We only have five to seven days of food on the island and seven days supply of prescription drugs on the island. Electricity, water, sewage could be out for months. And if it's, we need spare parts for the mainland, it could be longer. And debris removal, have you ever thought about all that, the glass and the, and, and the wood and everything that's collapsed? It might inhibit the ability of first responders to get to you. So there'll be a lot of blocked roads. So what can you do? I know all of you are, are concerned about your employees and everything. You need to take care of yourself and your family first, right? So about 300 to 400,000 people would need to evacuate and about 800,000 would be displaced after a major storm. Um, and there, I hate to tell you, but there's not enough shelter space. There's really not enough shelter space. Um, if there's a category five, there's not too many places that would be safe, including the shelters. They're only rated for about category two. So you really should try to shelter in place. 
Um, how many of you live um, outside of Kaka'ako area? Also, we'll see everybody does. Okay, well, first I'll cover Kaka'ako because you guys work here. <laughs> and, um, and some of you live here. So in a high rise, um, there's a red zone for the ocean to about the farmer's market area, which is about here, right? That's the red zone. That's if there's a tsunami warning, get out of here. And then there's a zone from there to about um, Thomas Square. And that's, well, you should think about it. If there's something like um, a category, I mean, a, a, a 9.0 earthquake from Alaska and you have four to five hours, you should think about evacuating. Doesn't mean you have to get out of here, though. It, you can vertically evacuate, right? So, um, so if you can't get out and you know that it's going to be all messed up, the, the traffic, and if you live in, in a concrete structure that's at least 10 stories high, you should evacuate to about the fourth floor at least. If it's a hurricane, don't go too high because you might experience swaying because of the winds. Um, and of course, if it's a hurricane or even a tsunami, you shouldn't be looking out the window, right? You should be in the interior um, rooms with no glass, the stairwells, and places like that. Um, so flooding, you know, most of Kaka'ako area will be flooded. Um, and not huge, like I was looking at the, the maps and it, I think maybe because of the, um, the reef, it's not gonna be like um, that typhoon that hit Thailand where, oh my gosh, it's like way up there. Um, but there's gonna be a lot of flooding, um, three feet or, or less in some areas, but some will be more than three feet. And you know that six inches of water can knock you off your feet, and two feet can, can float your car away. And it's not just standing water, it's waves of water. It's, um, it's going to be currents of water, especially in a tsunami where there's um, a series of waves, right? So this place is going to be flooded, and you might get trapped if you're at work and you didn't evacuate. So you need to have, even at work, um, all of your things like shoes and stuff that I'll talk about later and food because you might not be able to get out. I don't know how long it's going to take for the waters to recede, um, so you might be trapped. And you know that when the electricity goes off, which it, which it probably will, there won't be any running water because the pumps will die. And so you will not have water either. And if there's a fire, the first responders might not get to you. So it's a really good idea if there is warning to get just get out of here, right? For tsunami, it's easy just go to higher ground. For a hurricane, you need to find a place if your house isn't safe, find somebody else's to stay with because our shelters are not great. They're just a place to hunger down. So as employers, I know they had a kind of a survey. Haima had a survey about what um, what employers could do, and employees really want to have a safe place and they might not live in a place that they feel safe. So if you have a building, if you're an employer and you have a building that you can invite your employees and their families to stay, that's a really good idea because not only are you providing your employees a service, but also they can work, right? Otherwise they're going to be somewhere else and you can't operate. So really we, we don't have enough shelter space. People don't know where to go. If you have a place where they can hunker down, it's a really good idea to try to provide that for your employees. So um, if your house was built before 1995, how many people have houses that were built before 1995? Okay, you need to strengthen your home, otherwise it might not be safe because that's when the building code was changed after Inihi. Um, and so what you wanna do is to have a continuous load path from the roof to the foundation, uh, I mean to the wall, and then from the wall to the foundation. So there's clips that you can do um, for, from the uh, roof to the walls, and then straps from the walls to the, the, the foundation. I know um, Stanford knows all about this, right? <laughs> if you don't, there's this really good book, and it's online. Just Google UHC grant or homeowner's handbook tells you exactly what to do. I mean, there's pictures of those, those L-shaped um, clips and all of that stuff, and um, it's a really good free resource that you should um, get. I was so scared this hurricane season <laughs> that 
I just put new um, hurricane windows in my home because I have all this glass and I was really scared. I have this big tree outside. And so what you don't want is for your roof to block because that's when all the rain's gonna come in and everything will be destroyed, right? So you wanna create an envelope around your house. So if a projectile like a tree or your neighbor's roof comes through your window, my windows are, um, it's not shatterproof, but it, it, it has hurricane film so that if it hits, it'll shatter, but it won't, it, it'll crack, but it won't shatter, so you won't lose your window. Because if you do, or if your door blows open, then that pressure will lift your roof off, and that's what you don't want. So, um, so, so try to protect your, your windows and doors. Um, also look for um, insurance. Remember, a lot of people found out the hard way. <laughs> And there might be actually discounts for hardening, so that's good. It's a good chance to do it. But um, sometimes the, if the hurricane, the, the rain comes from the top, yep, that's hurricane insurance. If it comes from the bottom and it's flooding, you might need flooding insurance and the hurricane insurance might not cover. And a lot of people found that out the hard way. You should have a disaster plan with two meeting places. Um, one right outside your home, like a fire, and uh, I always, I remember, my kids are really old now, but a long time ago, I remember them saying, you need to have a meeting space right outside your home. And so we had a tree right by the mailbox. So if something happened in the middle of the night or, or something sudden and they had to go, that's where we would find them. And about two years ago, a big island family fled their burning home and the father couldn't count heads fast enough. He just didn't know, he wasn't sure whether his kids were out. So he went back in. They were outside, but they didn't have a meeting place, so he couldn't find them like in the middle of the night, and he died. So that's a really good lesson that you need to have. If you don't have it, please, please do that. The other thing is if you can't come back to your home, you should have a, another area right outside in your neighborhood so that, okay, I can't get home, there's debris or whatever. Ours is the Kaiba Key Library, because I live in Kaiba Key. So find another place, because you do not want to panic when you can't find your, your family during a disaster. You should also have a contact list of people. And I went to Katrina, and I was so scared when I came back. I made a list, and I've been keeping it ever since, of both sides of my family and all the different contact information, so that even kids in dorms will know where, where to reach people. And um, when an area is devastated, it's often harder to call from here to Diamond Head than from here to you know, Virginia, because all of the, um, the wires are tangled. So you should always have a, a person outside the meeting, um, I mean, on the mainland or whatever, so that they can say, everybody can call, and they can say, yep, mom is okay, she's in the Niliwani shelter. That is, there's not gonna be any communication. <laughs> so that's the best um, line of defense to try to do that. And then you should know the, your evacuation route, but you notice that they don't say where the evacuation centers are anymore. They used to have the phone book, they used to have it online. They wiped it all out because um, it might not be open, right? And people, you should know where you could go, but unless you know that it's open, don't go, because it might not be open. It might be destroyed, or we might not have enough volunteers to staff it. So that's why listen to the radio, um, have an app, and all that, and they'll tell you which shelters are open. And then if you have your, your kids, if you have kids that are in school, know their school's evacuation plan so that you know that if there's a tsunami and Iolani school has to go up the mountain or wherever, you know where they are. Because people tend to just flood over there and you're, you're just causing a worse because they have their own plans. So, disaster kit. I have that, um, I gave you a B Red Cross ready brochure that has all kinds of things. But I kind of just wanted to point out some of the things that you might not think about. Shoes. I did not want to wear high heels all the time. And so I have shoes in my car, I have shoes at my office, and shoes in my um, disaster kit at home. Because um, foot injuries are really com uh, a common cause of injury after disaster because of the broken glass and wires and things sticking out. So please have shoes all the time. Your first aid kit might save your life might not be able to get to a hospital or anything. Of course, toilet paper and toiletries, canned goods that are durable. Sometimes people forget the can opener. This is a really good um, thing because it has, um, it's a radio, strobe light, flashlight, um, and it has um, solar, and it also has 
a USB port under over here so that you can connect your cell phone and it's a crank radio so that you can you don't need batteries so you can always use this to know what's happening this is a lot of people have flashlights but you have to hold it like this right you, how are you going to do stuff and so I like this because it emits light going upward and you can just put it down and it's really cheap and it works um, I know that ponchos are not very cool, but boy, it'll help instead of an umbrella that's turning inside out and you're holding stuff, a poncho is, is a great thing to have. Emergency blanket, I have one of these in my car. Campers use it. I've seen um, it a lot of different places where you just put it somewhere and it, it'll keep you warm. It's, um, it's thermal. And then, of course, a multi-tool. This is something that's, it's called a water bladder. <laughs> Never heard of that. But they, it's called, they have something like this at City Mill, it's called Water Bob. You line your bathtub with it. And you know how they say, oh, fill up your bathtub when they, like, before the electricity goes out and the pumps stop working. Well, you, no matter how much you scrub your bathtub, I don't know if you'd want to really drink that water, right? So um, this will line it keep it clean so that you don't have a bathtub full of water that you can just do water the dish, the, the lawn and, and flush your toilet with. You can drink it and it's 100 gallons and you can pump it out by a spigot. And that way, if you are able to return home or stay in place in the first place, you'll have all, a lot of the water that you need because it's one gallon per, per person per day. Um, and then you don't have to buy so many tons of, um, of, of water bottles. Um, I like to have things like this, and peanut butter, and nuts, and things that are nutritious. And then um, a whole bunch of dollar bills and some loose change in case um, you go to, if you're lucky enough to have Walmart that's open, they're probably not gonna have change, they're not gonna have credit cards. So cash is king when, when a disaster happens. Oh, and then, of course, I see the dog. <laughs> Don't forget your dog, your, your pets. Um, we will try really hard to co-locate them with you in the same area. Um, but a lot of people are there just scared or whatever, and so you need to bring them in a crate that they can stand up and turn around in, otherwise the poor dog is going to be in there for a long time. Um, of course, a water bowl and, and towels and toys and leashes and, and all of that. Um, how am I doing on time? Somebody just has to yank me. I'm almost done. Okay, so I talked about, uh, there, there's a free emergency app, and it's, it's um, for, for Apple and Droid phones, and it, and it looks like an, emerg an explanation point. And it used to be that we had a hurricane app, and a flooding app, and an earthquake app, and they put it all together, and it's just a one disaster for all disasters, and it tells you what to do before, during, and after any kind of disaster. But it also has, a first aid for humans and a first aid for pets. How many people have a pet? I have two dogs. Well, I've used this app before when my dog was choking, and it tells you what to do if um, the dog ate chocolate or whatever, what signs to look for in, in case that happened, or how to do mouth to stunt resuscitation, or if your dog get, just got hit by a car, what to do. And the first aid app is great. In fact, I have it separately on, on my phone. And if somebody just dropped down right here, what, what would you do, right? It walks you through it, you're panicked. And it has a one 911 button. It also has a real, um, in real time, a shelter finder. And it's connected to the national shelter um, system so that when we open a shelter and you have that app, you know it's open. You can go right there. So that's handy. It also has a one button, I'm safe and it, it'll broadcast to all of your people on social media that, I'm, that you're safe. That's pretty good to have if somebody's on the mainland and doesn't know where you are. So um, download the free um, emergency app from the Red Cross. Um, and then ready rating, you guys are all business people. I'm, I'm so worried about the state of Hawaii when something like this happens because 40% of businesses will not open after a major disaster, and 90% will fail after two years. That's all of Hawaii is small business, right? And I know that people live hand to mouth, but we need to encourage people to go and, and try to, um, to, to try to prepare. And this is this readyrating.org, and you have a flyer there, 
that says how to get on. It's for businesses, schools, and organizations, and it, it assesses your readiness. So you take a little test, and then immediately it tells you what to do in order of priority, because you don't want to be overwhelmed, and it has all kinds of videos and checklists and toolkits and all kinds of things. And it's not only natural disasters, but it's um, man-made kind, like active shooter and chemical spills and all the other kinds of things. So please, if you have clients that, that could use this, tell them to go on, they can plan for a disaster. Um, let's see, I'll just, I'll just do one more thing. Um, so sound the alarm. We, in Hawaii, we respond to um, four disasters. Um, um, I mean, uh, disasters every four days, and most of them are house fires. So the American Red Cross, about five years ago, said, you know, we, we want to try to get ahead of this. So um, we have this program called um, Sound the Alarm, which is a home fire campaign to install smoke alarms in the homes of vulnerable populations, like the elderly, disabled, the people that need to get out quickly because seven Americans die every day in a house fire, and smoke alarms cut the rate of death in half. So we go in teams of volunteers, and this is a really good um, employee engagement thing. We have a lot of companies that, that do this, and it's only four hours, it's a turnkey operation, you get to wear the Red Cross vest, you go into people's homes, only one person has to be, um, has to climb the ladder with the drill, that's not me, the other people, Teach, teach them um, how to escape and, and do a, a plan. And so in, since its inception, um, about five years ago, we've saved 627 lives nationwide. That's a lot. So um, we, we always need volunteers. Everybody um, says they want to volunteer, but when the time comes, sometimes we don't have enough. And so our poor volunteers are really strapped. Um, so if you want to volunteer, that's the only way we can do it. Volunteers are 95% of our workforce. And of course, we always need donations, right? So thank you very much. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm sure I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. I know it's scary to think of and it's easy to procrastinate, but um, thank you for the valuable information and the reminder of uh, how urgent it is to be prepared and planned uh, for a disaster. So thank you again. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Stanford Carr. He is the president of Stanford Carr Development, LLC, where he oversees an extensive portfolio of projects ranging from master plan communities, to resort style living, to affordable housing. Stanford is known for building communities on a foundation of family living, the spirit of the islands, and respect for the land. And since 1990, Stanford Car Development has completed over 5,000 homes and is, is responsible for some of the most recognizable residential communities in Hawaii. Most recently, he's completed Halekawila Place, 204 unit affordable rental project located in Kakaako and Keaogo Place, Hawaii's first mixed use transit oriented development. Presently, Hale Kewalo, an affordable rental project in the heart of Kakaako, is near completion. Born and raised on Maui, Stanford has made giving back to the community a core value of his corporate philosophy. He serves as a trustee for the University of Hawaii Foundation and is a board member for the Rehabilitation Hospital of the Pacific Foundation, Hawaii Council on Economic Education, American Red Cross, Trust for Public Land, Chamber of Commerce Hawaii, Karakai Charities, as a chair of Move Oahu Ford, and board of director for Home Eat Hawaii, and board member and former chairman of the March of Dimes. So let's give a big round of applause to Stanford Park. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, Sherry, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, emailed me and asked me if I would share um, what's happening in Kaka'ako and what have we been doing. So 
just wanted to share uh, the past, present, and a bit of the future. So, Holly Coelho was our first uh, rental project that we embarked on in Kakako, breaking ground in 2012, December of 2012. It's a 204 unit uh, tax credit rental project. 199 units in a 19-story tower. We have five three-bedroom townhouses overlooking Mother Waldron Park. We also have uh, 4,000 square feet of ground floor commercial. We've got the wine and sake loft, a convenience store, um, a spa salon, as well as a bro cafe. We call it the Japanese burrito. It's very healthy, very popular, so please visit it. Um, this is the first hut high-rise development built in the urban core of Honolulu in over 40 years. It was a very complicated uh, project with the capital uh, stack using uh, low-income housing, federal estate tax credits, private activity bond financing, and HUD FHA Ginny Mae uh, permanent loan. Here's a photo of uh, our our lobby. Uh, you see the Powwow. A graffiti frame digital uh, monitors that provides uh, up-to-date uh, current affairs in Kakaako and notices to the tenants. Our recreation room, with, uh, which is adjacent to the laundry facility so that you can hang out here and do homework or watch TV and got ping pong tables. We have flex furniture that allows you to move this all aside. We've got storage rooms in there to break out tables and chairs for for community meetings. We also have uh, HPD coming in to do neighborhood watch. The, the residents of Holly Coelho on every last Saturday, Saturday of the month go out and clean up Mother Walton Park, um, have a little Kanekapila music and make a day of it. Part of the request for proposal when we responded to the state agency about building Holly Coelho is there used to be a trailer uh, on this site this is the site of once upon a time Po Kaina Elementary School. In fact, last week Friday I went to their annual reunion at the Japanese Cultural Center. But one of the requirements was to set aside about 400 square feet for a police uh, office, like a substation. And uh, when we built the facility, uh, HPD had no use for it. So what we ended up doing was investing $250,000 in computers, 3D printers, laser models, and turned this into a maker. So the resident children of Holly Coelho, after school and on Saturdays, go under the hood of Minecraft and learn how to code, and learn how to use different softwares utilizing these 3D printers to make things. Uh, we've now rolled into having the parents come in uh, during the week and learn how to learn computer, computer literacy, learn how to utilize these different softwares, codes, as well as make products out of the laser printer and laser routers uh, and 3D printers. And also coaching them on how to build, uh, produce form, format resumes to help their careers. Next, we went and broke ground on Keho Place in October of 2015 and completed Hawaii's first mixed-use transit-oriented development in 2017. It takes up the block of Halekawila, Kiawe, Pohukaina, and South Street. We worked with hard to redesign the transit station in order to make it much more compact, respecting the corners of Kiawe and Halekawila, South Street and Halekawila to make it much more inviting and accessible when the transit station comes in and is built, and it will happen, okay? Um, but we wanted to create a, a TOD that amenitized the neighborhood, and we worked with Kamehameha Schools to master plan the entire block. You'll see here on the ground floor, 31,000 square feet of ground floor commercial that's slowly filling up. Uh, the KIA is having their a fundraiser in a couple of weeks at Gastro Pub, which is located right here along uh, Restaurant A. Um, so above the 31,000 feet of ground floor commercial includes our front door and lobby to Keoho Place, which is a 43-story high-rise with uh, 388 units in the tower, one, two, and three-bedroom units. 
uh, rising, uh, lining the parking structures, not only the ground floor commercial and our lobby of Keoho Lane, but four levels of 35 townhouses that line along Pohukaina and South Street. And this was enabled us to, to screen the, the parking structures so that we could create a much more humanistic scale along the street's edge in a much more pedestrian friendly neighborhood with canopy trees for shading. Uh, this is our eight floor recreation deck. Uh, out looking out from the uh, fitness center at a Satoru Abe bronze sculpture. You can see the, the pool deck here on a sunset evening. Much, uh, very much like a resort environment. Our front lobby along Keoho Lane. And the reason why we named the project Keoho Place was there once was upon a time a lane called Keoho Lane. There was a Malcolm Akai Lane from Halikawila to Hupoho Kaina. In fact, it was called, it was known as Aoki Camp. Uh, many of the people that went to Poho Kaina grew up there. Uh, here's a photo of our, our lobby, our commissioned uh, slump glass mural. Light fixtures that we brought in from Spain and, and a water fountain along the back wall here. Again, another photo of the uh, retail commercial promenade of Keoho Lane. You see the pedestrian bridge up above that links the rental apartments on the Kiabi Street side of the, the property to the parking structure on the, the Eva Inn. Next, we broke ground in uh, February of 2000. In 18, Hale Kiwalo. Uh, Hale Kiwalo uh, was completed this past May. It's fully leased, 100% occupied, with 128 rental apartments. And because of its proximity of being directly across Ala Moana Shopping Center, this time we built no studios. We wanted to emphasize families. So we built 27 one bedroom apartments, 72 two bedroom apartments, and 29 three bedroom apartments. We also reached a deeper affordability, utilizing federal and state tax credits and private activity bond financing, and the Rental Housing Revolving Fund, which is a vital bridge gap financing necessary to augment with the federal and low-income housing tax credit to reach deeper affordability. So our starting rent for a single person that makes just over 25000 a year, that works at Ala Moana Center across the street, a $686 a month rent, including utilities. $850 for a two bedroom. Uh, but, but, but most of the units are rented to households earning 60% of the area median income. What does that translate to? That translates to a single person making approximately 50,000 a year, or a family of four making 72,000 a year, and a single person paying on one paying $1,300 for a one-bedroom apartment, $1,600 for a two-bedroom apartment, and up to $1,800 for a three-bedroom apartment. So, a photo of our recreation room, again, with flex furniture, um, right there on the ground floor. There's a typical unit. Uh, we've got vinyl plank flooring, fully appliances, all air-conditioned in each of the rooms. Um, all quartzite countertops in both the kitchen and baths, including ceramic tile tub enclosures. In December of 2017, we were selected to acquire a portfolio of 1,221 rental apartments from the State Housing and Finance Development Corporation. It involved these three high rises in Kaka'ako, Pohulani, Kauhale Kaka'ako, Kamaka'i Vista, just a couple of blocks around, away from here. Uh, also involved the property in Kapolei, Kekuilani, 80 apartments, which coincidentally we developed 25 years ago and sold it to the state. Now it's full circle. We just bought it back in May of uh, this year. Another property in Honokawai, Lahaina, and a property in Kona called Lailani. We're budgeted to expend $85 million over these 1,221 apartments, approximately $70,000 a unit. And so we will be starting on all three high-rises contemporaneously. We're about 60% completed with the renovation drawings today. Uh, our plan is to uh, maintain, maintain these as
as affordable units for the next 75 years. We entered into a regulatory agreement with the State Housing and Finance uh, Agency. Uh, we're reinvesting in the asset. We've got a recasted 75 year ground lease at a dollar a year. So we're starting on the three high rises. We hope to have uh, our model units completed within the next six weeks. Kalhale Kaka'aku uh, comprises of about 200 and, let me get my T notes here. I'm supposed to know all of this. But 226 apartments. Uh, next we have Pohulani Elderly, which is a senior housing of 263 units. And Kamake Vista, which is right across the street, totaling 268 units. Now, much like what you, we've learned with Halekuwila, where we have the Makery uh, computer lab for our resident kids as well as uh, the adults, we're developing a residential services program for all of our residents here. For the seniors, we're going to have activity directors, collaborate with Catholic charities, collaborate with other activities as, you know, uh, Tai Chi, uh, yoga, computer classes to teach them technological literacy with respect to their iPads or iPhones. Um, with respect to the family households, we're working on developing a program for uh, financial literacy, home ownership counseling, because we see many of these families that earn up to 80 plus 100 percent of the area median income becoming potential homeowners someday in of our future projects. And so what they need is some, uh, some, some counseling on home ownership, but also on credit counseling. And so we're pretty excited to uh, embark on that program to help these people move up the housing ladders. One of the other things I want to bring back and mention is projects like Hale Kawila and Hale Kewal are great for, for young professionals just starting off because as they get promoted, their earning power grows they can now start saving for a down payment. They're not forced to move out of these apartments. They need to qualify with the income limitations to get in. But once they're in, and they earn more, they don't, they're not forced to, 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 to vacate. So they can now start saving and move up that housing ladder, eventually, hopefully, becoming a affordable home buyer in a reserve unit in one of our future projects. Uh, and then, therefore, thereafter, start building some equity. So that's the beauty about this. And unlike most of the rental inventory are private investor owned condominiums, which rents go up not consistent with median incomes, but based on what the market dictates and commands. So we'll be <clears throat> investing 85 million over the next uh, two and a half, three years over the six properties, including these three high rises in part and to maintain more affordable units. Um, we're also right now in the midst of designing another mixed-use transit-oriented development project. Uh, this one will become, uh, it will be an amalgamation of everything we've built in the past. It'll be, we'll have within this block tax credit rental apartments, workforce rentals that we built in Halekewale, Halekewale. It's a moderate entry level for sale as we built at the Kale Hole Place. Um, and amenitize it again with ground floor commercial and introduce what you see here is a generous uh, urban park. Um, we feel that the, the park is a, and the open space is a, not only a visual but uh, a very nice amenity to have within the density of Kakako. Thank you. So we are 60% through our drawings. Um, next week, Friday, we should have all our subcontractor numbers in to renovate the uh, mock-up units, a model unit for each of these three high-rises. Uh, and then we'll embark on, start uh, renovating in January of next year. <clears throat> we see that as about a 18-month uh, to two-year process, floor by floor, unit by unit. Right now, we're having people go through every unit as to every detail that needs to be uh, renovated. 
So we're changing cabinets, flooring, painting, light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, upgrading elevators, modernizing it, uh, upgrading all life safety issues, um, and, and just making big improvements. We have a property manager called Hoy Affordable Properties. They've been managing these properties for years. Um, so in order to maintain continuity, they will continue to manage the property. As of the, uh, the agreement we entered to with the state was all existing tenants of record of the day of the closing are, are, um, are protected to stay there. It's like, as long as they live there and continue to pay their rent and abide by the the rules, the house rules, they're there. Um, we've got a lot of tenants, in, especially like Pohulani elderly, that gets rent subsidies from the state called Rental Assistance Program. Um, we accept Section 8 vouchers as well. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as people move out and, and move on, um, you know, we'll, we'll be looking for a tenant replacement. So I would suggest that they contact Hawaii Affordable Properties. Um, for to get on a wait list. Uh, in our Holly Coilla Place property, that's managed by Indigo Real Estate. Uh, they also manage the Franciscan Vistas, a senior rental that we developed back in 2000 and we, in Eva, well, back in 2007. Yeah, we developed that. Yeah, we, that was our first senior rental that we did on behalf of the Sisters of St. Francis. We got hair salon, swimming pool, fitness center, you know, arts and crafts room, computer lab. Any other questions? We're actually going to renovate in place. So we worked with Hawaiian Dredging. We took them up to a high-rise project that was being uh, renovated in Sacramento, California, where they're renovating in place. So the logistic uh, scheduling is not by the day, but by the minutes, by the hour. So um, it takes five days per unit. So very different, it's out of the box, but we've learned from those who have done this on the mainland, as opposed to the historical way it was like the hotels, take a whole floor, you know, strip it all down and go floor by floor. Here, we're going to renovate in place. So we've uh, got all of the subcontractors and dredging has bought into it. We're negotiating with them uh, to do all of the, the three high rises contemporaneously. Any other questions? Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Sanford, for all that you're doing to develop and redevelop affordable housing, refresh it in uh, Kaka'ako. Um, yeah, that's great. So I, now I'd like to introduce um, our last speaker. Um, her name is Sharon Moriwaki, and she is a state senator representing Kaka'ako, Sheridan, Makali, Mo'ili'ili, Alamana, and the Waikiki areas. She is a member of the Senate Committees on Ways and Means, Housing and Technology, and also co-chairs the Legislative Kupuna Caucus, which works with Kupuna service providers and advocates in addressing policy issues of importance to our Kupuna. Until March of 2019, she was a faculty member and co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, a collaborative of energy st stakeholders and community leaders working toward clean, and sustainable energy independence for Hawaii. She also served as Associate Director of the Social Sciences Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she helped to develop and implement the Hawaii 2050 Sustainability Plan and develop programs in community development, energy, and sustainability. So let's give a, a big a round of applause to Ms. Sharon Moriwaki. Everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I know some of the faces here, so and I, I want to commend Stanford on a great job. You know, before uh, I became a senator, I was uh, <laughs> a community 
the advocate for this community, uh, looking out for um, what Kaka'ako was envisioned to be a mixed-use community, not only with um, housing that was affordable for the whole range, uh, not merely luxury housing, but also those that Stanford is now concentrating on, those with the 80 percent, 100 percent of the median income families, so that the ideal was that people would live here as well as be able to work downtown and walk and commute uh, in areas in Waikiki and downtown. So that was the concept of what Kaka'ako was envisioned to be. And HCDA became the uh, overarching uh, zoning and um, oversight for Kaka'ako. And, and therein lies the problem um, and, and um, um, I guess separates out Kaka'ako from the rest of the city. And the city has plans that are much more uh, consistent with their um, uh, planning for long range, whereas in Kaka'ako we have uh, the state legislators get involved, uh, the state zoning under the Hawaii Community Development Authority. So it's not quite as I'd say uh, in, in terms of comprehensive community that you see in other areas of the state. Um, that may soon change. The legislature is looking now at the stadium authority, looking at HCDA as a planning organization being more equipped to look at building new communities. In 1976, when Kaka'ako was first developed, it actually uh, was industrial area and, it, it, and, and the state put in something like $200 million for the infrastructure to start the development of Kaka'ako. Um, it was slow, slow going, but the same idea with the stadium authority, they now have something like 100 acres uh, in the stadium, 20 of which they were using to make an entertainment center. They want to redo the stadium as you've read in the paper. Um, the other 80 acres we're hoping <laughs> can be part of the transit-oriented development kinds of planning where you can actually have more affordable housing for our people. We are losing our young people. We are losing people moving to the mainland, not only because of jobs, but also because we don't have housing. And the homeless are a result of not having housing. So housing is critical. It is a major, major problem for our state. We are looking uh, at various options. I just came back from Singapore with the housing committee uh, and a delegation to look at other options for us. How do we build more? We need 65,000 uh, housing units by 2025. Uh, in Honolulu, it's 44,000. Um, that And most of the demand is at Stanford is now building things in Stanford at the 80% AMI or below. That's less than the median income of the population. Yet the housing that was built in, in Kaka'ako uh, was at the high end, uh, over 140% AMI, um, uh, above the median income as well as luxury, and, and really is not housing a lot of our local families and young professionals. So the push right now is how can we how can we build more for our local residents so that we can keep our kids here, we can also build community. And while rentals are good, we also are looking at how do we build housing to buy. Whether it's a small unit, and you see some of these uh, coming up, there are two, two buildings uh, that are micro um, units so that they're smaller, but that's for the young people, they don't need much, they just need their computer and their phone. So, um, so it, it, is, it is something looking to the future, but also looking at the past, because elderly also don't need very much, but they need to be housed, and so I'm glad that, that some of the, the development is coming up for the elders, because we really need to take care and honor our, our, our parents and grandparents, so that they actually live their later years in their own homes and not necessarily into nursing homes. So the, the bills that passed this session really had to do with a number of issues that are front and center, obviously housing, a uh, number of, of bills and if not bills, legislation uh, and appropriation 
was for rental housing, was for housing, was for infrastructure, uh, and for rent supplements because a lot of people who are homeless are like one paycheck, uh, or who are still in homes, rents, are one paycheck away. They lose lose the paycheck or, or uh, they have some kind of expense for, for a hospital expense and it's, it's done, you're out. So we put in another million dollars, I think there's a million dollars, and now there's two million dollars to help uh, the Public Housing Authority give out monies so that up to $500 and can't make rent, you can get a supplement so that you stay in your own rental unit. Because what we're finding out is the homeless um, are really hard to house until, um, you know, if, if they're more than a month into being homeless, it's, it, it's harder and harder. So they have um, developed now um, uh, a uh, landlord summit where the agencies are working with people who have units that they could rent out and, and working with them to assure them that there's a case manager with a homeless family or homeless person. Um, if they damage anything, that will be paid for so that it's like renting out another unit to anyone else, but affording the homeless to have a, something over their heads, and especially those with families. So um, the focus this year was on housing, affordable housing, um, also with our elderly. So, so the kupuna, kupuna staying in their own homes, getting the kinds of uh, supplemental, um, help that in, whether it's in housing or in services or helping their caregivers so that they can continue to work but still care for their loved ones. Um, those are the two main areas in terms of the homeless, of course. We have expanded the Ohana zone so there, there can be some shelter developed in areas with the private sector uh, so that we can have some kind of shelter to get the homeless out of the streets, out of the sidewalks, out of the parks and into something a lot more um, livable, at least until we can get permanent housing. And one of the things we did pass, it's not money, but it's law, um, where it's called a community assistance pro pro uh, treatment, where now if about a quarter of our homeless are either uh, on drugs or have mental illness, and they won't go into shelters, uh, we can bring in a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist can say, uh, this person really needs treatment, uh, and they can actually commit a person where before we could not do that, so they're staying on the streets, and it's become uh, a public health hazard, actually. So we are looking at ways in which we can really address the homeless problem before it becomes like San Francisco, or Los Angeles, or uh, Seattle, and because at that point, I saw, uh, I don't know if you saw the Seattle is Dying documentary, but there was a map of Seattle, and it was almost all brown, and that was the poop map. So, I mean, it, it really has come to proportions that if we don't, we don't address it on the front end, we could be in the back end having to deal with, and really not knowing how to deal with, a problem that really becomes a public health issue, not just the homeless on the street that we you know, walk by. So again, working as a community, and for Kaka'ako, working as a community, I'm glad to see that we have um, a number of different organizations here because all the organizations plus the people who live here are really important to making community. You know, um, in the past, I've talked with uh, Tata Po from Howard Hughes uh, that was developing the housing, and yet it was building by building, when we, what we learned from Singapore um, was that when you develop, you develop neighborhoods, you develop a park, you develop amenities, you develop not a building, but what is the community. So what's beautiful about it is that all of the transportation is connected. Amenities on the lower floor, um, retail shops, stores, markets, um, whatever is, is also the profit made paid from the, the amenities actually helps the, the unit owners uh, pay down their maintenance fees. So, it, you know, the, the kind of integrated thinking of caring for each other, looking at
community is really what we've lost over the years and maybe is coming back as we start developing housing that really is not just a roof over your head, but it really is trying to develop people um, working together, living together, and caring about not only their own unit, but, but all of their environment. See, Loretta over there, one of the other resolutions we passed was to help the Children's Discovery Center. Uh, it, or Loretta was, I'm talking about poop, so anyway, <laughs> so she was cleaning poop every day before she went to her, her beautiful, wonderful program for the kids. Uh, and that was just really egregious. We could not let that continue. Uh, we now have a task force that has met two times, meeting again in early September. But, but what's beautiful about what has come about from that, and I know Lorena has gone through this many times before, is that we've got the city homeless director, we've got the state homeless coordinator, we have HPD, we've got the sheriffs, all different jurisdictions, as well as partners in care, which is service agencies. There are about 30 agencies that deal with the homeless, uh, which is the primary problem there in Kaka'aku and one waterfront park. And all of them coming together and finding solutions that work. How do we deal with this problem? So the HPD goes out with, with the, sometimes with the prosecutor's office, because now all of these homeless don't want to come and talk to the police because they figure that they're going to be taken into custody. Well, they, the prosecutor's office and the public defender's office sends a representative with them if they've got a sheet, sheet this long of, of misdemeanors, they will have they will take them in and have court with them um, and let them off if they're all misdemeanors so that they can get them into appropriate housing because most of the charges are because they have no housing. So, so again, it's community coming together. It's people working together and solving problems. Not, oh, that's, that's not my jurisdiction or that's not my job. And I think we've come to a point where we're growing so large and we're so working two jobs, we're so concerned about our own, our own well-being, we forget that if all of us have the same problem and we don't work together, it's, it's going to be even worse, and we're losing people, and we're lo losing that sense of community. And, and that's what I hope that in our efforts, in my efforts, my office, I'm always available. If there's anything that's a concern, we, we try to tap into wherever we can to find a solution to the problem. And if we don't, we keep bugging and bugging <laughs> so until we, we know that there's something. Because not everything, and most everything is not solved by law. We, we know, because we've passed laws, and we go back, and, and I go back. I, I say, well, the bill was passed, what are you guys doing about it? Uh, we're working on it. <laughs> you know, so, so we, we need to be on top. It's not just passing the law. It's making sure the law is enforced, making sure the law is actually, if it's not working, to come back to the drawing board and say, hey, that didn't work. We've got to change it. We've got to amend the law. And that's what makes community really important. Um, there were bills that I called on people, you know, this is something that might affect you. People are too, too busy. And yet, we're making laws that affect every one of you. And, and unless we know its impact on you, we're, we're passing laws. I, I know there was one that passed that even my husband complains about. It's the white man crossing. <laughs> um, there was, it was, the police were, because we pass laws, we pass laws um, that affect you in terms of the, the street light, the, 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 the highways, the uh, uh, crossing lights, but the crosswalks and the lights are all put in by the city. So the law is, when you cross the street, you know how the white man comes, the white man comes out and walking? the street lights, the traffic lights. Well, the law now is that if your foot is in the crosswalk when the white man is still walking, you're okay. As soon as the red hand comes up and you put your foot in there, you are going to get a ticket. That's the law now, and it, it passed this past session. 
My husband says, that's crazy. What are you guys doing? You know? But nobody came to testify. That's crazy. So that, and then, and the police said, well, that's what we do, but we don't have any, you know, any law that says that. So now that's what it is. But that was because nobody said there was a stupid law. So there it is. We have a stupid law. Um, and so I'm trying to work with HPD to say, okay, how about, you know, not having the tick down, you know, the 20, 20 19, 8, the ticks down, right? But when the red hand is up. Well, if you're a fast runner, you see that hand, you say, I've got 20 seconds, man, I'm going for it, right? <laughs> so, and then that person, they get a tick, my husband got a tick. <laughs> So, so, so if you didn't have the ticker, you would say the red hand and you'd wait, but it's a long wait. So, so again, I, that's just one example of it really is important for you to get, at least know what's going on, get involved, contact your legislators, not all of you live in this area, if you live in this area, even if you don't, you can call me. But call and, and find out what's going on because it does impact you. It's, Minimal as that is, it's a humbug or it's a nuisance to do this. But it, it, it does affect you. It does very well affect you. Um, there, there, people come to us, so the, police, the uh, fire department said, you know, we need another fire department that serves Kaka'ako. So we do have a resolution. We are working on something uh, to have another fire department. I think that they have sort of convinced DOE to share space. So they're going to use the Linakona School um, as another fire department and moving some offices there to serve as Kaka'ako, a larger area, because they have one on South Street, but they need one on the other side. So again, things like that are important. Um, we hear from people, um, the more, the better, so that when we do move forward, um, it does really solve problems and not make more problems. Um, I do want to say some of the things that, that I've been working on that affects Kaka'ako, but it's not legislation. Um, as I said, this transfer of, well, what, what this area is known as um, is Kaka'ako Community Development District. And it now is overseen by HCDA. So that's why the police couldn't come in because police is city and the sheriffs are, are state enforcement. Uh, the sheriffs don't do a good job like the city in terms of the homeless, in terms of actually executing some of these kinds of laws that we want them to execute on and they're shorthanded. So um, so we, we did work with HCDA um, again from the uh, uh, Children's Discovery Center problem was to work on transferring all the parks in Kaka'ako that's under uh, HCDA, because they don't manage parks very well, um, to the city. And so that's in process, hopefully soon. Uh, I think HCDA just appropriated 800,000, the city doesn't take anything without getting some money. So it's $800,000 to fix whatever it is in the parks that are being transferred, and hopefully that will come about. Uh, so that waterfront park, um, and uh, Gateway Park are all going to be under uh, the city, and the city knows how to take care of parks, so your parks should be nicer, um, and parks are important to us. So um, that's, that's what's going on with um, keeping the parks um, open to the public. Again, um, one thing I did want to bring up, because I've been talking to uh, Bert Lum, who's the Broadband Strategy Office for DBED, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Um, he's tried to put in uh, a subsea fiber optic cable landing. I know that sounds really high tech. I don't really understand what that is. But what it does do, if, it's a, a, if it comes about, is that you can have all the connections, global connections um, with, um, with technology, with the internet, uh, and that would be connected. He's having problems getting that through. It was before the legislature last session, and we didn't quite understand it. So it's, he's got to come back with it. But the more that um, you can understand what's going on in your businesses, so being connected with the world is important, and Kaka'ako could be that model. And if we don't have it, 
these cable agencies, these cable companies, which just bypass the white and there's so small respect. So it's really important to think again in terms of what is it that we want to be, how can we be connected so our kids can live here, have good jobs, and still be connected with the world and, and really develop the kinds of business, clean businesses, that we can have for our kids and their, their generations going forward. Um, and so if you have any interest in that, I'm sure Bert would really appreciate getting some help from businesses who can come in and testify on his behalf. He was one and only person before the Ways and Means Committee, before the uh, Economic Development Committee, and it sort of um, is still kind of on the table. So. Um, those are the kinds of things, again, with business, with, with um, your housing, all of these are important matters that other people were supposed to be representing your interests. So, so we are deciding for you what we think you need. So it's really important for you to tell us what you need so that we actually do the people's business for the people and you folks benefit from it. So that is, be, that, that is really my message to all of you is that what we do in the square building there does matter. <laughs> and you don't want to be coming to us after the fact because it's really hard to change the law after the fact. So it really is, if you see any problems, not all of it as I say is legislative, but it really is important to let us know. We can make contact with other state agencies. Um, a number of the pro pro problems um, that we're solving are not by legislation, it's by communication. It really is letting the agencies know what needs to be done uh, and, and most times, um, we've been able to get it done <laughs> without much, you know, fanfare, but it gets done. Um, so I think those are the major, major areas. I can answer any questions that you have, uh, but I'd like to encourage you to um, come talk story, call me. Uh, I've got some, yeah, my email, my phone number. Again, yeah, I, what I say is I work for you. I mean, you pay my salary. <laughs> Basically, we all, we all work for you. So you don't forget that. Don't forget that. We are your servants. So uh, if you have questions, I'd be glad to answer anything. I think if I can answer it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Moriwaki, uh, for updating us on what you and the legislature are doing to help with, obviously, um, big issues, affordable housing and homelessness. Um, so this actually concludes our program for today. I hope all of you um, found the information to be meaningful and valuable. Um, and on behalf of the KIA board, I'd just like to thank you all for attending and, and taking time out of your day um, to, and your, for your continued support, uh, not only as members, but for being part of the Kakako Improvement Association and participating in events uh, like this. So I do have one, um, before you leave, one announcement is if you can please return your name tag, uh, which are on the lanyards, lanyards, and if you can leave that at uh, either with Sherry or at the table um, as you exit, um, and we'll use that at our next meeting. Okay, have a great day. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>